So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Lee Vane. Uh, Dr. Vane leads the separation research team at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's National Risk Management Laboratory. Uh, his team has been active in developing green separation technologies, and in particular, membrane-based uh, evaporation and vapor permeation for volatile organic contaminant removal from aqueous waste, alcohol <coughs> recovery from water, and solvent recovery use. And most recently, the team has been focusing on the recovery of ethanol and ketanol from dilute fermentation growths and the subsequent dehydration to uh, meet uh, fuel specification. Uh, so Dr. Vane received his uh, Bachelor in Chemical Engineering from the University of Delaware uh, with distinction on summa cum laude, of course, and his PhD also in Chemical Engineering from Cornell University. And since 992 that he joined the U.S. <coughs> Environmental Protection Agency, he's focusing in research uh, related to uh, separations. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, and the stage is yours. Thank you. So good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to speak with you today. I'm going to go over where, what is research and development within EPA, where does that fit? and then talk about our work on these membrane processes for volatile fermentation product recovery and, and dehydration. So most people are familiar with the EPA as a regulatory organization, and that's certainly our main function. Um, Office of Air, Office of Water, and those are located in Washington, uh, D.C. There's also 10 regional offices, breaks the country into 10 regions. San Francisco is headquarters for Region 9. So uh, their job is to enforce those regulations and work with the regulated community. We also have 10% of our workforce is in research and development, and that's to help hopefully inform better regulations and better uh, implementation of those regulations. And I just did something, so I didn't. Okay. Um, and our main engineering research function is headquartered in Cincinnati, Ohio, and that's what we call the National Risk Management uh, Research Laboratory, so risk management. Within that, uh, we have a group that focuses on what we call sustainable technologies, and that can be anything from uh, life cycle assessments, sustainability metrics. We've got some people looking at uh, what does it mean to have a sustainable watershed, so what are some of the indices and ways to maintain that. We also have a group that's focused on green chemistry and green engineering. How do we make chemicals and materials in a more sustainable or greener manner? And so that involves chemistry, that also involves uh, engineering. And that's the group that I belong, in, belong to. This uh, National Risk Management Laboratory is headquartered in Cincinnati, Ohio. So our main, EPA's main research, biggest research is in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina but our second largest center is in Cincinnati. And this is our structure, so a seven-story uh, research facility right across from the University of Cincinnati. We also have three pilot facilities in Cincinnati. <coughs> One where I have some of my work, it's called the Test and Evaluation Facility. It's a high bay research center with its RICRA permitted to handle hazardous waste, as, uh, so it's got some unique capabilities. <coughs> So High Bay is also on the grounds of a wastewater treatment plant, so if you ever wanted to uh, open up one of these pipes and get primary digester sludge or something like that, it's a pretty sweet. Uh, sweet crude is what we call that. Uh, so that, that's what, where we have some of our uh, equipment in the High Bay. So why is, why is EPA involved in biofuels? That might seem a little obvious to some. Uh, main reason is because Congress told us to be involved. <laughs> and that was through the Energy Independence and Security Act. And they told the EPA to ensure the ever-increasing volume of renewable fuels. So traditional conventional corn-based ethanol is actually capped at, uh, at, a, at a 15 billion gallons per year. Uh, and then we're tasked with coming up with advanced biofuels that have better greenhouse gas reduction potential than conventional corn-based ethanol. So why do we need separation technologies? Well, if you're involved in the fermentation end of things, you know that uh, you couldn't burn your fermentation broth. Uh, and so in order to mix these 
fermentation products with fuels, we have to get to a purity level. And ASTM standards say that it should be less than one volume percent water. So somehow we have to go from the fermentation broth concentration to 99 plus percent of, of this product. So obviously, it, it, nature doesn't do that on its own. So we have to help it. A few years ago, I wrote a, a research article looking at some of the separation technologies that we could bring to bear to do that separation. I broke them into two groups. Alcohol recovery, so how do we get the stuff out of the fermentation broth, and then alcohol dehydration. So once we've got it out, we still have some water in it, and how do we get out that last bit of water? And you'll see some of the same technologies are in, on both sides. That doesn't mean that you can just build one adsorption column and do the whole thing. Typically, you're going to do adsorption, say, with a hydrophobic adsorbent to remove the alcohol from water. And then on the other end, it's an adsorption with a hydrophilic adsorption adsorbent to remove the, the water from the alcohol. So typically, it's two or maybe three different unit operations uh, tied together. The conventional approach is to use distillation to take the alcohol out of the water, concentrate it up to a point maybe 95% called the azeotrope, and then use molecular sieve adsorption to remove the trace bits of water. Well, distillation is, is, uh, acts based on the principles of vapor-liquid equilibrium. And so if you haven't looked at a BLE diagram today, here, here's your opportunity. Um, oops, man. Ah, no, not so fast. So, so what we have here on the y-axis is the vapor phase composition. That's an equilibrium with a liquid phase composition of the alcohol. So here's ethanol. Here's butanol. And then we also put a diagonal in there, the, the y equals x line. And what we like to see for distillation is a big difference between the diagonal and our BLE curve. And that means that the vapor is much more enriched in, in, in this case, the alcohol than the liquid phase. And that's how distillation works. We, we create a vapor, we essentially condense it, we re-evaporate it until we, we enrich it up to as high as we can go. Where, where things get complicated is where these lines get close or cross. And that's where they cross is called an azeotrope. So ethanol, we can concentrate it up to this point, and it actually crosses there at about 95% ethanol. And what that means is that the vapor has the same composition as the liquid, so we can't, can't keep doing that. Uh, we have to do something different there. And that's where we start to bring in the molecular sieve adsorbent. Butanol presents an interesting case. And, the, and isobutanol has about the same behavior here as, as uh, one butanol. You see that horizontal line, that then implies two phase, two liquid phase. So the azeotrope is actually a two phase azeotrope. And on either side of the azeotrope, we get very good diff distance between that and the diagonal. So that means that we can use distillation on one side to produce pure water, and on the other side to produce pure butanol. So let's, let's take the uh, ethanol case. How do, how do we do it today? So if you walked into a corn ethanol facility, you'd see something like this for the, the separation train. You've got your fermentation broth coming in, and we, we feed it into a, what they call a beer column. It's essentially, it's the stripping part of distillation. Uh, we provide heat at the bottom in the reboiler. That creates essentially water vapor that strips out the ethanol. And then this ethanol vapor is leaving, and that's sent to a enrichment or rectifier column where we provide cooling to provide condensation. So let's say you had 5% ethanol here. The vapor here might be 35 weight percent ethanol. And then coming off here might be 94, 95% ethanol. And then we would send it to a molecular sieve adsorption bed in a cyclic mode. So we're loading the adsorbent. It's removing water. And then we have to regenerate the adsorbent so it's done in a cyclic manner. Most of the energy goes in here to create that water vapor that strips out the ethanol. So I said this is about 35 weight percent ethanol, 65 percent water. 80 percent of the energy went into creating the water vapor. So water management is important in this, in this, to the energy efficiency of this process. And, and so how much energy does, does that take? So this is a, a, you'll see a few of these coming up. So on the y-axis is the energy recovered to 
energy required to recover ethanol, megajoules of fuel per kilogram of ethanol recovered. As a function of the ethanol concentration in that fermentation broth that, you, that you're feeding to that uh, beer column. And this is a typical hockey stick uh, type of hockey, sorry, hockey stick curve um, where we get a plateau at very high concentrations and then when we get to lower ethanol concentrations it really ramps up very quickly. As a point of reference, the fuel value of ethanol, lower heating value is 27. So it's up, up here somewhere. So if, if you're making ethanol out of corn, what's that about, 15 weight percent ethanol? So you're out here, you're out in the plateau region, you're using maybe four megajoules. That's a fraction of the 27 that the ethanol contains. That's why you can use distillation for, for ethanol. You start making it out of sugar cane, that's, that might be sugarcane juice, that might be 7%, depends on how you process that juice. Still plateau region. You start making it out of lignocellulosic materials, depends on the, how you're doing that, but that might be 3 to 7%. So now you're starting to back up this curve. You're starting to do syngas fermentation. So you took the biomass, you created syngas, you fermented that syngas. Most of those are in the 1 to 3% range. You're starting to make ethanol directly from CO2 with algae. You're down at 1%. So you can see how some of these alternative ways, renewable ways of making ethanol, the energy, this is just for the separation. This is not the, you know, how you break the biomass down or anything like that. So you're starting to use a, a large fraction of the energy that the ethanol contains in doing the separation. It says nothing about the cost of that energy. So, so if you've got a cheap source of waste steam that's usable in this process, you, know, you may not care. But if you're paying for natural gas for each of those units of energy, then you do care. And, and, and the reason you care is this is current industrial price of natural gas. One unit here <coughs> represents two cents a gallon. And you say, well, that's not much. If you got, you're making 50 million gallons a year, that's a million dollars a year just for one unit. On that. So, so it turns into real money if you're paying for, for that natural gas. So that was ethanol. Let's look at butanol. So this is chemical, engin chemical engineers in the audience. Shout out. All sitting on this side. Near the door, <laughs> see? So this, this, I, I say it's a textbook. This is truly a textbook case of, of separation. You open up Perry's Chemical Engineering Handbook and, and you'll, you'll find this in there. So, because it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful situation. So I showed you that two-phase liquid uh, azeotrope. Uh, so <coughs> let's say your fermentant is an AB, uh, just forget ABE, this is just butanol and water. You're feeding it in, same kind of thing, stripping column. Main reason here is to get the butanol out. The overhead vapor, you condense it. It's enriched enough in the butanol that it forms two phases. Butanol-rich phase, water-rich phase. Water phase goes back to the stripping column. Butanol rich phase goes over to this column, and butanol is a high boiler, so it comes off pure off the bottom here. I mean, it's fantastic. Oh, yeah, it's a chemical engineer's dream. So, so the question is, how much energy does that take? Sim same thing. Hockey, you can't get rid, you can't get away from the hockey stick. There's, there's no, there's no free lunch on this. Well, today there's free lunch, but there's no free lunch. On this. <laughs> so. Same thing. So this is now megajoules of fuel per kilogram of butanol recovered as a function of the butanol concentration in the butanol water feed to that distillation system. Lower heating value of butanol is higher than, than ethanol, 34 on the, on the mass basis. Um, and actually, I didn't superimpose them, but the curve for butanol is just slightly below that of ethanol for the same concentration in, in the broth. So not a, not a huge benefit uh, for, for the butanol case. So, so where does uh, butanol start in, okay, question to the audience. When, where, when does normal butanol start inhibiting, say, uh, one of these ABE fermentation organisms? What concentration? <coughs> is that when it starts inhibiting it, or is that the... Oh, sorry, that's like the, when it comes Yeah, so inhibiting might be half a percent, right? So these things, I mean, some of these super hyperbutanol producing guys, they might be at 2% at most. And inhibition starts at a half a percent. So, you know, you're, you're using a lot of the energy to do that 
to do that separation. And if you have acetone and ethanol along for the party, uh, because these organisms don't, you know, they don't want to just produce butanol. So now you're talking about a treatment train that looks like this if you want to produce separate. And so that just adds complexity and cost to, to the system. So distillation is, why do we use it? Well, it's hard to beat when the vapor liquid equilibrium is favorable, which is the case for, for ethanol and butanol at low concentration. But we're limited by, by these azeotropes. And a lot of alcohols, isopropanol, form azeotropes of water. And, and I alluded to it earlier, but how we manage water vapor is very important to this energy management. If, if the energy going into that reboiler for the stripping column is 80% to evaporate water, somehow we have to figure, figure out how to minimize that or handle it in a different way. So it's back to our, you know, okay, uh, wh so what do we do now? We've got uh, distillation and adsorption at high concentrations good, at low concentrations we've got some issues. Well, the, the, the ones I work on for evaporation and vapor permeation are two technologies that we work on. And I'll talk a little bit about fundamentals of those and why we think those might have some application in this, uh, in this area. So membrane processes. Most people are familiar with the top one, filtration, things based on size separation, microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration. You apply a liquid pressure to a, a suspension of cells or, or molecules in water, and the water gets forced through the membrane, and the larger things get retained by the membrane, rejected by the membrane. Well, what the processes I'm talking about, th that, that won't work for ethanol water. I mean, ethanol water, will, they're miscible. They'll just go right through. So that doesn't give you any separation. So to get separation, you need to have something that acts on a different principle. And, and the principle we're going to use here is solution diffusion. So we're going to separate using a membrane that things come up to the membrane surface, they sorb into the membrane material, so now you've got absorption selectivity, and then they diffuse for the membrane material. And you have a diffusion selectivity. And so this is a dense membrane. Then you pick it up, you look at it, you're not going to see, you're going to look at it on a microscope. You're not going to see holes in it. It's a dense membrane. So the, the word pervaporation comes from permeation and evaporation. That's the, describes what happens here. Pervap, the feed is a liquid phase, miscible uh, liquid. We have a dense, or you might call it a molecularly porous membrane if it's a zeolite. They sorb into that membrane surface, they diffuse through, and then they evaporate because another difference here in the membrane is the, what comes through the membrane is a vapor. It's not a liquid, it's, it's a vapor. So we have, in this case, we have a phase change occurring too. And if we can select that membrane then to selectively remove alcohol from water, then we've disrupted your normal vapor-liquid equilibrium. We can do the same thing by putting a water-selective membrane. So what comes through the membrane, we can dictate what comes through the membrane. Got to to put one equation up here. Uh, the flux, the throughput through the membrane, is a permeability divided by a membrane thickness times the driving force. And we describe the driving force as a chemical activity driving force, and we represent it with a partial pressure. So we calculate a partial pressure on the feed side based on chemical activity saturated vapor pressure and mole, mole fraction. On the permeate side, it's a vapor, so it's total vapor pressure times a, times a mole fraction. That's all. That's it. So obviously, you want to make thickness as low as possible, get your throughput as high as possible, and you want as high a driving force as possible. To get the membrane thickness as small as possible, we usually put our separating, our dense membrane, might be a, a micron thick. Well, that won't stand up on its own, so we put that on some kind of a support material. Oftentimes, it's like an ultrafiltration membrane that we put a dense film on top of. So that's how we get that thickness as, uh, as small as possible. <coughs> the, the process in general in PERVAP, so, so the magic happens here in the PERVAP module. That's what 
these guys will tell you. Uh, but we have to link this with other unit operations to make it all work. So saturated vapor pressure is important. How do we affect that? We raise the temperature. So typically the feed liquid would be heated to raise the temperature, raise the driving force. The vapor that comes through, we have to condense that somehow. So uh, in the lab we use liquid nitrogen. BP, would we use that industrially? Not, not in my life. Not in his life. <laughs> he obviously doesn't work in propane, prop propylene separation. But, uh, but yeah, you wouldn't do that for, for biofuels, yeah. Um, usually what we do is cr we create a vacuum by condensing. So the vacuum pump is actually very small. The condenser does most of the creating of the vacuum. Uh, but it has to be done at a lower temperature than your feet. So yes, you can do pervap at 30 degrees Celsius, but that's you can do that because you're doing liquid nitrogen collection here. If you start to go to more industrially relevant conditions for your condenser, you have to heat it up to higher temperatures. <coughs> vapor permeation. So almost everything I just told you about pervap, very similar for vapor permeation, except for the feed is a vapor. We already have it in vapor phase, so things, things are a little simpler. The, uh, Equation's the same, but we just calculate the partial pressure, a little easier calculation. And then in this case, it's not the feed temperature that's important, it's the feed total pressure, the vapor phase already. So, so why? So why are we interested in these? Because that membrane, that dense membrane, we can disrupt the vapor-liquid equilibrium. If we can do better than the VLE for, for ethanol removal from water, then we reduce the amount of water that's evaporated, and so we have the potential then to save on the energy. On the other end of things, if we can remove water more efficiently from the ethanol than VLE, remember we, VLE actually stalls out, then we can save energy. So uh, we're not limited by thermodynamics. Well, we are, but not by VLE thermodynamics. Uh, so where, where has this been used or, or proposed to be used? And, and hopefully just from that discussion you get a the sense that dehydration of organic solvents is, is historically and today still the, the main use of, of these technologies. We and others looked at chlorinated solvent removal from groundwater. Um, and then there's been a lot of interest in fermentation product recovery. And a growing area is actually organic organic separations. So if you want to reduce sulfur in gasoline or in fuels, if you can come up with a membrane that selectively removes those sulfur-containing compounds, then I mean, huge, <laughs> that'd be a huge application. Our, our research at EPA, uh, uh, focus, focusing on the biofuels most recently, we're looking at how do we replace distillation. Well, to do that, we need to find ethanol-selective membranes and maybe re tweak the process a little bit to, to make it a little more efficient. If we were, want to remove the molecular sieves for drying, then we need a water-selective membrane. So we've been working on some water-selective material. And then if we want to try to rethink the entire alcohol water separation, then what we've proposed is looking at a, at a hybrid where we try to take the best parts of distillation and hopefully the best parts of the membrane process and do it in, a, in, a, in an efficient way. And I should mention that uh, We've been, had a long-term collaboration with a company just down the road, uh, Membrane Technology and Research. They're currently located in Newark, California, down by Fremont. So we do bench scale, just like you guys do, but slightly different bench scale unit, but 40 square centimeters of membrane, you know, something we can make ourselves. Um, for alcohol selective memory, so how, how are we doing on that front? Um, not, not particularly well. So, silicone rubber. So if I take that VLE diagram I showed you in the beginning and just look at the, at the ethanol, low ethanol range, so 0 to 10 percent ethanol, the far left part of that. Here's the VLE curve. Silicone rubber, this is what silicone rubber would give you if you used it for evaporation. So essentially it gives you a worse separation than VLE yet it's still cited as the benchmark material for ethanol and, and often referred to as ethanol selective memory. Why is that? The reason for that is 
if, if I have 5% ethanol solution and I use my silicone rubber membrane, what comes through the membrane is going to be 30% ethanol, and I say, Eureka, I created 30% ethanol from 5% ethanol, and therefore it's ethanol selective. Well, it turns out if I just didn't have a membrane there in the first place, I'd get almost 40% ethanol. So, what does a membrane do other than cost me money to put, put in, the, in the way of na Mother Nature? So, silicone rubber in the case of ethanol is not uh, particularly useful in this case. Oh, yeah, okay. For butanol, it turns out it is uh, selective. So, uh, point here is VLE on this molar selectivity curve is one. Here's uh, ethanol at 0.6, and here's butanol at, at, in our hands at uh, 1.8 to 2.0. So it, it's about twice that of, of VLE. So for butanol, silicone rubber looks like it has some, some potential. What would be really nice is if we could get something that would be well, way up here. Boy, that would be nice. Um, so that 5% solution now is producing a permeate what comes through the membrane is 85% ethanol. Boy, that'd be fantastic. So that's, that's a zeolite. That's an inorganic material, silica light one, and it, and it would do that. But it costs a lot to make a membrane out of pure zeolite. So we and others looked at what's called mixed matrix. So instead of trying to make a pure, defect-free zeolite film, we make a, a zeolite powder, disperse it in that silicone rubber, make a membrane out of it, and we get properties in between that of the two materials. It's called mix, mixed matrix. And it, and it works. So, mostly. mostly. I'll tell you why, what the mostly part is. So this is a picture of the membrane we made. Um, so on the top here, this is the mixed matrix material. That silicone rubber is the continuous phase, and then little Zeolite particles, this is what a zeolite looks like if you were, uh, I don't know what you would have to be to see that. But <laughs> these, th these are on the molecular scale, these pores. So uh, ethanol and water, remember ethanol, uh, water is small, smaller than everything else, so it goes through these pores too. But the pores are sorption selective for ethanol. So ethanol gets in there, sorbs, and blocks water from going through. And so that's how you get this uh, selective benefit. Uh, it blocks water from from going through. Uh, I also mentioned that uh, it'd be nice if this was one micron thick. If you look at the scale here, it's about 100 microns. That's just because we're looking for the properties of that material, not so much trying to make a, a perfect membrane. But there's the ultrafiltration pore support. There's the dense film on top. And, and, it, and it worked very well. So here, uh, for ethanol water, in this case, it was a uh, selectivity of 2.5. Remember, BLE is one on this scale. So we're, in this case, two and a half times that we had one that I think was four times BLE. Butanol water here is up around seven. Fantastic. Well, the very behavior that made the zeolite wonderful is that it, it selectively absorbs the ethanol and blocks the water, is the Achilles heel here. So if I throw in a little butanol into that ethanol water mix, butanol then selectively adsorbs and blocks ethanol. So here's the, here's the experiment. We start with ethanol water, we get 2.5. We throw in a little butanol into that mix. Look what, look what happens to the selectivity of ethanol. It drops down to one. Because butanol is now outcompeting ethanol for those adsorption sites. Now the ethanol has to go primarily around the zeolite through the PDMS phase. And when you put it in a fermentation broth this is an actual ABE broth. Even butanol starts to drop. Why is that? Organic acids, esters. You know, I, I showed you that thing about what the ABE organism, organism is producing. There's a lot of bunch of stuff dilute, but still there. So that's not that's not workable. It, it blinds off too too quickly to make it work. We can regenerate it, but it just didn't seem to be a, a particularly workable solution. So if, so if all you had was ethanol water or butanol water, I've got a solution for you. 
Now let's look at the other end of the spectrum. So now instead of uh, 0 to 10 percent ethanol, we're at 90 to 100 percent ethanol. This is where we need a hydrophilic material. Y equals X line is up here, and here, polyvinyl alcohol is your benchmark, and you can see it's very far away, so it's fantastic for doing this separation. You can get hydrophilic zeolites that are even better. So those molecular sieves that we use for adsorption in corn ethanol facilities as beads, you can grow that as a zeolite, as a, as a, as a membrane, and use it as a membrane. So that's what zeolite we're talking about here. It's the pores are only big enough to let water through, so this competitive adsorption business is not a problem. So it turns out if, if you just replace the molecular sieve adsorbent in the ethanol process, you might save 15% with, with a pervaporation system. There's been a few studies that show that. So there is some benefit to that. But it's not the big energy benefit that, that we would like to see. And the reason is it doesn't attack the energy of the stripping column. So how do we, how do, we do that? Well, we, we envisioned a, uh, a process where we're going to use that same beer column, that stripping column, because what does it do? It handles solids very well. It gets very high recoveries of the alcohol. So, that, so the stuff leaving here might, be, might get 99.9% .9 removal of the alcohol. So that's desirable because you don't want your product going out to waste. So we're going to keep that part of it, but we're going to try and recycle the water vapor. And the way we do that is we take this vapor that comes off the top, and we're going to compress it as a vapor, keeping it as a vapor, about a 5 to 1 compression ratio. And then we're going to run it through a membrane module as now in vapor permeation mode. In this case, we're going to use a water-selective membrane. Easier to get, more selective. And what comes through the membrane then is going to be almost all water. We're going to keep it as vapor, and we're going to return it to the stripping column. And it, and it will naturally do that because we've got a compression ratio here. So let's say our column here is at 0.2 atmospheres, and we're going to compress this up to one atmosphere. So here, this would be at 0.2 atmospheres. So we have a, a 5 to 1 pressure ratio, and that vapor will just go back into the stripping column. So that, that handles the water. The ethanol then is rejected by the membrane. It's at pressure, and we can condense that as well against the reboiler and recover that heat also. So all of the heat that we lost in creating that vapor, we recover. And then the question is, okay, we've added mechanical work. Okay, does that make sense from an energy, energy standpoint? <coughs> Just some concentration. So the 5%, 30% vapor, our product is over 99%. What comes through the membrane is at least 90% water, and our effluent here is less than a tenth of a percent ethanol. So we did uh, chemical process simulation on that general design. We added a we have two membrane steps because to get to the low water product concentration, you need a little bit lower permeate pressure than, than this 5 to 1 compression ratio. That's what I'll call a first generation. Uh, more recently, we've done a, a second generation where we break the compression into two steps, and in between that, we add a fractional condenser. So that reduces the amount of compression energy greatly reduces the amount of membrane area. Um, so we'll see how that affects the total energy use as well. well. One thing to be careful of is that we talk about energy use on a similar basis. A joule of, of electrical energy is much more valuable than a joule of thermal energy. So. There's, there's a number of ways that you can try to put them on the same basis. One is cost. <laughs> That's always a good, good one. Uh, the way we do it is we put them into what we call fuel equivalents. So if you saw those graphs I showed on energy before, it was megajoules of fuel. So what I assume here is that for thermal energy, I burn some fuel to make that thermal energy, and I'm assuming it's 90% efficient to do that. Industrially, it might be 80 to 85%. depends on the problem. Where we take the big hit is fuel to electrical energy. In, in the U.S. grid, that's about 33% efficient. 
And further, for my compressor, I assume it's 75% efficient. So that means that for one joule of mechanical work, I required four joules of fuel. That's, that's a pretty big penalty. But, turns out, <laughs> it works. Um, because the, if you're familiar with heat pump concepts, I mean, you put in some mechanical work and you're moving a lot of thermal energy around. So, so this coefficient of performance of, of, a, of a heat pump. So here's ethanol recovery energy. Here's that distillation curve I showed before. And here's the first and second generation vapor stripping membrane process. And you can see that we can save up to 70% of the energy and on a fuel equivalent basis. So now, you know, for the same amount of energy that it was taking to do distillation at 10%, I can do that same thing at, at almost 2% ethanol. Doesn't mean the whole thing's going to work, because <laughs> there's all sorts of other costs associated with trying to make just 2% ethanol. But at least from an energy standpoint, we can do that equivalent. Butanol, the same thing. So it's just this, we're using mechanical compression energy to move around water vapor and save on thermal energy. Again, if you have free thermal energy, uh, do distillation. I, <laughs> that may be the answer. So uh, we've demonstrated this. So we did ChemCAD process simulation, said, yeah, that should work. So we demonstrated this in our collaboration with uh, membrane technology and research. They make uh, membranes in this spiral wound format. This is a hot box. So this is vapor permeation of ethanol water vapor. So it's got to be above the boiling point of that mixture. So we typically heated it to 115 degrees Celsius. Um, we had a six stage stripping column, packed, uh, structured packing stripping column. And uh, we did it with laboratory prepared, binary, ethanol water, butanol water, and ABE water solutions. And then I was working with a biochemical engineer who, who uh, fired this 80 liter fermenter. We needed 200 liters to, to do a pilot test, so we did a bunch of batches. We centrifuged the broth to stabilize it and then uh, used it for a course of a week. When we did those broth tests, we tracked about 20 different compounds because we were interested in where do they where do they end up in the process? From acids, alcohols, esters, ketones, sugars. And we sampled five different locations in the process, liquid in and out of the stripping column, and then the three vapor phases, streams. <coughs> this is what the yeast fermentation broth, little brown fermentation broth, brown coming out of the stripping column. These are the condensates of the vapor stream, so obviously the color doesn't fault a lot. And then we calculated based on how much steam we actually used in the stripping column and how much compression energy we, we used, uh, how much energy we used. And the stripping experiments agreed with distillation and our, when we did the, brought the membrane process into it, those agreed with our membrane simulation. Is this process back from a gone kind of process? Or? No, this is uh, no, not that advanced. No, this is y, uh, a YPD uh, media, so it's, con it's a controlled media. It's not, not, a, not as exotic as that, but we still found those 20 different compounds. Um, so for the ethanol, it, it agreed with the simulations, and for the butanol, it also agreed with the simulations. So we felt pretty comfortable that our simulations ac accurately reflected what was going on in the process. So, capture, <laughs> try to capture all of that. Ideally, we'd have an ethanol selective membrane. High throughput, very ethanol selective or butanol selective membrane. And then we'd replace the distillation column. But I just don't think we're there yet, at least for ethanol selective membranes. There's some interesting things with butanol selective. I think it might be easier to, to, to make that happen. Water selective membranes we can get. And so it may be 
more relevant, at least at this moment, to design to try to figure out how we can design systems to take advantage of those. And then hopefully I convinced you that, that this membrane-assisted vapor stripping process can save, I mean, 70 percent of the energy. So we're not an order of magnitude reduction, but we're pretty high reduction. And that the performance was not affected by the presence of the fermentation rod. And uh, shameless self-promotion. <laughs> Got some review articles and some uh, tutorial that I wrote last year. And uh, if anybody has any questions now or in the future, you can contact me. I do have one thing. So I, was, I, I happen to be born in San Jose. So I am a Bay Area. I moved before I was one, but I was born in San Jose. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll ask you, so based on my name, you, anybody have an idea what Bay Area University I might have an affinity for? Stanford. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's right. Leland Stanford Junior University. Yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> But I do like your blue and gold. I mean, I'm a Del Delaware blue hand. That's blue. So thank, thank you for your attention. Appreciate it. That's like putting blood in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's the right color, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we have plenty of time for questions. So the 70 percent energy savings that you said, they are basically heat, heat energy savings, right? Uh, that's, that's on the fuel, uh, fu yeah. But does that also include the compression cost? That includes, that includes on a fuel equivalent basis, okay. accounting for the thermal energy and the compression energy, and the compression energy is what, what, what's the difference. And I, and I will say in many of those scenarios, we don't require it, any thermal energy. It's all, it's all compression. There are some scenarios where there is some thermal, but in, there, in some we actually have excess thermal just because the compression itself adds thermal energy to the system. Have you guys looked at, you know, so NREL keeps publishing all these uh, reports from time to time for retinol from the like Right. Have you guys looked at what <coughs> what impact this technology would have on their entire power generation and all that sort of stuff? I haven't done that kind of an integration. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's an important step. I guess my argument, I, and I've had some questions about, and that's why I mentioned that this, if you have thermal energy, spare thermal energy that's effective at, at the temperatures that you need it at in this process, this, you wouldn't get the same savings from us. But that's going to be situation dependent. So, I mean, I could pick up the NREL report and look at it for their process, but it may not apply to some other process. So that, but because, because certainly lignocellulosic, if you have spare biomass to burn and you have cogen, but then there's a question about if you're taking steam out of the right, exactly. So I don't want to get into the <laughs> into the weeds on that one. Fair enough. Yeah. How do you get the energy out of the partial condenser? Uh, that's a. How do I get the energy out? Let me just make sure I'm this this deflagmator. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you well, there's two ways to imagine that, but but, but let's just imagine it as a, a heat exchanger. And so let's say you took uh, I didn't show the the heat transfer loop, but suppose you took a uh, liquid uh, and ran it in counter current here as a heat exchanger, and then ran that to your to reboil. So the, the, the process simulations that I ran assumed that there was a 10 degree temperature difference between these two, so it was useful uh, heat from this step down to here. <coughs> Another way to look at it is, I mean, you could even do, I mean, there's some distillation things where you, you do compression and then there's a divided wall distillation here, so you actually do condensation on one side of the column and, uh, uh, or condensation on one side of the column while you're doing stripping on the other side. So it's, it's how do you, there, there is a thermal transfer between the two. And we assume there was useful, the temperatures were such that the, that the heat was useful in the tube. Does that answer your question? Kind of, does it go on top of the column? Is it, is it, uh, 
the heat from here? Well, you, you could you could do it all in the in the condenser. Is it, no, I mean, does, it, does the condensed phase, do you send that, it looks like that's in the top of the big distributing column. Is you would send it to whatever point of the distillation column typically what matches that composition. And usually it's at the top because we're, we're not, a, if we added heat here, this concentration would be low, but we're not, in this particular design, we're not adding heat. So if this is coming in at, say, 35% ethanol, then this would probably be 5% ethanol, which is the same as your broth coming in at 5%. But it's, it's, it's hot, so you might want to bring it in a little bit lower. Same, same with this vapor stream. So depending on what selectivity of your membrane and what this vapor phase composition is, it might be pure enough to send right to the very bottom of the column, or you might bring it up to a few stages. On an energy basis, it doesn't seem to really matter. Do you have a, a plot that shows uh, potential performance of, I mean, I'm sure you could do it, versus the membrane separation factor, you know, the, the thing that you showed for ethanol being below a wave of VLE, you're not doing anything with the membrane, but butanol, you have a certain separation, but if you improve that, how would that impact your hockey stick curve? To the yeah. Um, I do. I have a three-dimensional one. I'm not okay. I, yeah, don't don't get worried. I'm not going to show it. <laughs> There's a three because the, the the two axes. One is separation factor, and then the other axis is percent recovery. And so, if you if you demand of that membrane system that it does 99% recovery, then your average concentration through the system is much lower, and so you actually evaporate a fair amount of water per unit alcohol. So that reduce that increases the amount of energy required. So it's really a three-dimensional plot, and yeah, it's a, it's a it's a bunch of hockey sticks. But it, it uh, the, the, I think the separate and I, the one I have is on separation factor. It does not selectivity, but you could do it on selectivity as well. It, it, you need about you know selectivity of over two, I think, for for uh, again that depends on the recovery that you want. Zach, yeah, I was just wondering. Um, you do a lepsilia for your shipping to do the cell? Uh, that was for the, the, the removal of the fermentation. Have you tried a cell cell? Is it because your shipping columns is not set up? Well, two, two things. <laughs> um, one is the broth was in the refrigerator for like a month. so. The main reason was to stabilize the broth, um, so we, we removed the cells because we had to do, you know, these fermentations take a while, particularly ABE ones, so we had to do a fermentation, you know, four batches in order to do this, so it took like four weeks to do that. I, but second point is that particular stripping column was not designed for stripping, it was designed for condensation. Uh, and so it was a wire gauze structured packing which I would not want to put cells into. Um, but stripping columns, they design them for handling cells all the time. So it's just our, our particular packing was not designed for, for cells. So really two reasons. 